morning practice. I hope everybody is healthy and doing okay. As we continue our, our uh, this pandemic going into the second year, um, it really calls on great patience and uh, constancy to uh, relax and uh, receive the, the um, situation of our lives freshly every day, just as it is. I wanted to talk tonight about simplicity and concentration. And even though not all of you are old, I think one of the things that's true as we age is that it's a process of uh, simplifying and concentrating. That's our, that's our job, to simplify and concentrate. Um, but it's also really kind of the heart of our practice is simplifying and concentrating. It's the heart of Zazen as we sit and we simplify. Let's just do that for a couple of minutes together. Just sit in a very simple quality of mind and heart, just simple, concentrated in that right here and now. There's nothing to do or feel or anything, just simple sitting, breathing. One of the things we, we can notice in simplicity, the state of simplicity is its lack of artifice. There's nothing artificial. Uh, we let go of artifice in simplicity as well as obviously complexity. So it's, a, uh, it's, an, open, it's an open state of pause and then concentrating which is um, fully present here, really right here. Intensely sensitive and private and naked when we are simple and concentrated. It's intensely private, sensitive and naked. Um, so I've been carrying around a quote for many years uh, from Master Hui Chang, who was a successor of Hui Nang, who was the sixth Zen uh, ancestor. And it goes like this, uh, when one is confused, one sees many distinctions with one's mind. When one is awake to one's Buddha nature, these distinctions no longer matter. When one is confused, one sees many distractions with one's mind, many distinctions rather, sorry. And when one is awake to one's Buddha nature, these distinctions no longer matter. So these, these words um, have been a great reminder and continue to instruct me because I, uh, I was really struck when I first came across them the distinctions no longer matter. I really needed to know what was he, what was he saying there? We don't want to misunderstand what he's saying. So these, these, uh, I, I wrote this down on a piece of paper and it's just, you know, when I moved, I packed it up and I pulled it out first thing. And so I see it uh, regularly and it is a reminder for practice. And I wonder if any of you have such a thing a favorite quote from Zen 
from the Zen tradition and that you've posted somewhere in your living quarters. A lot of people have quotes on their, um, on their screens, you know, when you write to them, you get a, we get a, uh, an email from one or another of us and it has a, uh, it has a quote at the bottom, but that's a little, that's different. That's different um, because if it's somewhere in the house, then just when you least expect it, you come across it and it leaps to your eye, just like a Zen master who's, uh, who's hiding in the shadows and jumps out when you least expect them. And it just reminds you, oh, right here, right now, this. So I encourage you to choose some, some favorite phrase and write it out and post it somewhere so you come across it when you least remember that it's there. So I've had this one, this particular, uh, as an active teaching for me for years. And it's a, it's a wonderful koan uh, that's sprinkled, sprinkled among many random moments of my life. When one is confused, one sees many distinctions with one's mind. And when one is enlightened to one's Buddha nature, these distinctions no longer matter. With more specificity, we could say, in what ways something matters and in what ways it doesn't matter. We want to look into that. In what way does something matter? In what way doesn't it matter? Uh, this is, this is a, a way of saying, of talking about the two truths, the relative and the absolute truth. Oh, we're always arising together. The two truths. We live in a world in which we act and respond as citizens, as friends, as family, relatives, spouses, uh, teachers, students, as workers. And the roles we play in life uh, are all asking us to act and to respond. So this is so, we need to do it. But we generally walk around therefore, distracted and confused and mentally complicating and lost in past and future or circling like a hamster in a cage in obsessive thinking, far away from the simplicity of just this moment, just this, just here, wherever we are, or in whatever we're doing, just this. It's, it's always a whole lot more than just this, or not always, but often. Uh, Aiken Roshi used to say in his, I mean, he was a big man and he had a big voice and he'd say, only this. So whenever I think about this particular theme, I, I hear his voice saying only this. In the uh, simplicity of our intimate now, our direct experience. But um, just by saying these words, just this or only this, though this is ultimately true, uh, it's not usually enough to wake us up from the dream of our personal subjectivity. Uh, the, se the sense of personal subjectivity, the sense of me is a dense, is a world that's dense with complexity and with um, all kinds of details all kinds of complications. Unless, of course, we're deeply concentrated. Unless we're de deeply concentrated and we're poised at the very moment in not knowing, in a sense of intimate openness, which is what we, we, we work with in Zazen, that, that poised in intimate openness as the koan states, we're at the top of a hundred foot pole. And we are, if we are ripe, we're ready to leap beyond knowing, beyond knowing, beyond any future plan. And we don't get to that moment until we've, we've kind of played out all of the alternatives. <laughs> we've tried everything to know and to plan and to keep control. 
in Zen practice, we seem to have to struggle. Uh, we have to make up all kinds of complications. And we're always doing this so that the drama of Dharma is as complex as everything else in our minds. All the 10,000 things of this world encumber every moment and encumber our practice, encumber us in practice. This is the way, uh, this is the way, this is part of the way. Huh? And this happens uh, because we're approaching practice with our ordinary thinking mind and searching for the source of mind with the mind. All the masters urge us not to do this, not to fall into this trap of searching for the mind with the mind. Instead, we are urged in the direction of simplicity, which is really hard. It's really hard to be as simple as just this. How do we do it? We wanna know how we do it which is different from just this. And yet how many of us year after year sit on the cushion and search for Buddha, search for Buddha mind, original nature with our thinking mind, uh, the mind of reason and outer authority, looking to outer authorities to show us a mind of, the mind of ambition, the mind of me and mine, or the mind that is never satisfied, that does not feel complete, that, that sees each moment is not quite it yet, it's not quite right. And the mind that only knows how to pay attention to its mental figments. I have a friend who used to call it the uh, fig newtons of our imagination, our figments, our fantasies, our mental pictures plans and judgments, everything that separates us from just this. It's not that that truth, that relative truth is irrelevant to our lives or not of importance, but it is only partial. And in practice, we're, we're looking to uncover the entirety of the field of mind. So how does being enlightened to one's Buddha nature change this ordinary approach so that all thoughts and distinctions no longer matter? What, what is that? What is that pointing to? Master Hui Chung suggests that a simplification comes about with awakening to the openness of each moment just as it is. The current state of this world is really complicated, is really complex, and living in it is increasingly complicated. Any step we take involves so many details, so many causes and consequences to look out for. So we are entrained to complicate and to track complications. This is, this is, uh, this is definitely a all of our challenge. So in what way can all these complications no longer matter? Surely this doesn't mean that we drop out of the world, but rather that we are now free to enter the world in an ever deepening way of wholeness. When we discover the living truth at the root of every moment, the living truth, the life of it, the vitality, then we are free, We're free to walk the right, the, the path right here that we've been seeking everywhere else. When all along you've been on the path, the path of your unique life, this is exactly the path. So in what way does all the complication not matter? What's the meaning of that? What's the matter with your life right now? Are you looking for something else, something different? Or are you doing what we're urged to do by all the great masters, those who've come to realize the deepest source 
in their own life, who urge us to look just as they have straight into the eyes of our most intimate wisdom wall. You know, in Soto Zen, we face the wall. That's the, that's the uh, practice. We haven't generally done that much in our group, but you face a wall and, the, and Bodhidharma did that. He faced, he went into the cave and he faced the wall of the cave. But actually, basically what we're facing is the wall, the dense, the dense uh, wall of unknowing. And with our own eyes, with the intense attention that you would pay if your hair was on fire. This is how we face this wall of our own mind. With intense, with an intensity of att attention. And this is how we engage Zazen. <laughs> we strive to. <laughs> Intensely present to whatever it is. Not, not really getting too involved in the narrative that's going on, even if it keeps on running. And, but the, the uh, attention has opened and is really wide. With this kind of undivided attention, we can discover the non-dual, the non-duality of relative and absolute. It's, it's just vast. We can, we can practice with true curiosity and also deep respect, looking nowhere else, but right where we are, this very body of this moment. That's one thing that, that we, we don't do, we can lose track of deep respect for our, the content of our experience. We want, it, we want it to be different, we disrespect it instead of taking it in as though we'd take in anything that we really have a lot of respect for, we pay attention. There's much here to be present to. And if we don't walk our ordinary life as the path, this very body of the Buddha path, well, how can we know its nature? How else can we know who we are? Buddha nature, but we get tricked by these words, Buddha nature. They're trick words. We, we shouldn't be fooled by the complicated thinking mind. What is the meaning of Buddha nature, these, these words? What is the meaning of this radical teaching of perpetual awakeness? Only you can discover this for yourself in your own perpetual mind. This is what's radical. This is why it's radical. It's always arriving wherever we are. It's always present, always available. Always transparent. So, um, oops, have you noticed how often Zen talks are filled with a lot of questions? You know, we make a statement and then we say, and what is this? <laughs> um, and they never get answered. These questions never get answered. They just get asked. And for so long, you know, I, I was really frustrated by this. My teacher would ask a question during a talk and I'd think, finally, yes, I wanna know. And I get ready to hear the answer. But instead they tell a story like this one. Um, Daiju visited the master Basso in China. And Basso asked, what do you seek? Enlightenment, replied Daiju. You have your own treasure house. Why do you search outside? Basso asked. 
Daiju inquired, well, where is my treasure house? And Basso answered, what you were asking is your treasure house. And Daiju was enlightened. Ever after, he urged his friends, open your own treasure house and use those treasures. So that's, that's the form, right? There's a question, there's a story, a question is asked. The, the, um, the teacher gives some kind of simple answer. Sometimes it's a puzzling answer. And then the student is enlightened. So actually it's, it's more about the state of mind of the student rather than the specific answer or the words that are used. And that's true. If you think about when something gets clear to you, it's not necessarily the words, it's your mind clears. It's awareness clears and opens. So what are your treasures? What are your treasures? Only you can discover these for yourself by always arriving where you are, as you are, by really respecting who you are. And this is where concentration comes in. This is where paying close and respectful attention becomes practice, is our practice. Seeing into and through our narratives which we call karma, the circumstances of our life right now, these circumstances is our practice. Uh, it can be like water, looking, looking at this moment in our own mind can be like water in a clear stream and we can see all the way through it, it's transparent. The mind at this moment is transparent. What is hidden? And this is where our treasure is stored, according to Basso. If you come to practice expecting to turn into somebody else, what you're actually doing is locking the treasure house door and hiding your treasure. And what is treasure? What is treasure? There's another question. What is treasure? <laughs> Not only what is it, uh, but, uh, but how does it function in your life? What do you do with your days and nights? What do you do with your troubles? How concentrated are you in the moments of your day? How present? Are you living as though there's a problem to be solved? Living as though you're a problem to solve? I mean, that's not respectful. And what if there is no problem whatsoever with any of this, uh, but just to experience it? This is the functioning that the Dharma speaks about. As Aiken Roshi so often said, enlightenment is useless unless it functions. Awareness and presence in our life, being present, the reason we do that is so that we can function fully and accurately and, and well, and on behalf of goodness and for yourself and, all, and others. And we can never explain how it feels to be alive. For life is washed in the speechless real. Life is washed in the speechless real. That's a line from a poem I, I read. And here's a story about uh, Master Joshu. A monk approaches and asks and says, Master, I just entered the monastery, please teach me. And Joshu says, have you eaten your rice? And the monk says, yes, I have. Joshu then says, then wash your bowls. And at that, the monk was enlightened. <laughs> There's that line. That's a very direct, simple, important teaching. This is the moment, what's needed right now. You know, the, teach, the teaching is not, as it functions, is not complicated. 
but there are a lot of teachings with a lot of complicated words and incredibly interesting concepts, which we all read, think about, talk about. That's fine, but also this direct simplicity, concentration. Uh, the painter Hans Hoffman said, and Hans Hoffman, I don't know if you're familiar with his painting at all, but he just, he just painted color. He painted color for the joy of the color, for the experience of the color. That's what I would say about his painting anyway. He said, the ability to simplify means to eliminate the unnecessary so that the necessary may speak. So it's really, it's really a way of deepening our ability to listen to what's being asked right now. What, what is being asked by these circumstances? This is a rather impersonal um, directive, actually. So we always attend to what's right here. Right here is our liberation. Right here is the freedom to be truly on the path. So I hope you'll, um, you'll take advantage of these two words, simplicity and concentration as you go through your days and see if they are functioning in your life. Thank you.